Good deal. How are you guys doing, Cleveland? Nobody? All right, good deal. Uh, yeah, uh, like Steve said, my name is uh, Tim Medine. My presentation, we're going to talk through about payload development. Out of curiosity, how many offensive people do we have here? Who's my pen testers, red teamers? All right. One person's excited. All right, cool. Blue? Even more excited. What are the rest of you guys? Managers? Audit? Are some of you in the wrong spot? All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so I kind of designed to this talk to be informative for the, 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 the blue team folks, also some of the, the red team folks. Give them some of the, uh, the ideas here on how we can do some of the payload development. And a lot of stupid tricks that honestly shouldn't work, but actually do. Quick intro, Steve hit all this, so I can just skip that. We'll save a slide there, one of my too many slides. I got like 60 minutes worth of content because I misunderstood how long, I, I misunderstood the assignment, but that's cool because we got like 35 minutes and I think my voice is going to last for about 20 of those. So we'll get you to drinks. Okay, I understand how important the happy hour is. But the, the goal here is to help some of my offensive people work through getting working payloads and also understand for the defenders, how the heck is this stuff actually working? How many of you, put your red teamers, put your hands back in the air. Is payload development a giant pain in the butt these days? I see a lot of nodding and some sadness, gentlemen's crying. Um, yeah, these days it's, it's a pain in the butt. Now, when I first started pen testing like 15 years ago, it was so easy, like to the point where it was like sad. If you actually got caught by antivirus, AV, EDR, back then and just AV, like you had to try. You really had to try to get caught. In fact, like we had a buddy of mine on a test, uh, also named Tim. He got caught and we were making fun of him. Like, what did you actually do? Like, you know how hard it is to actually get caught? Like, how, how did you even do that? Like, we were surprised. Like, it was amazing. Now, fast forward, it's a lot harder. Getting that initial access, getting that payload to work, or even once it works, taking some of the actions that we need to take to accomplish our, our goals here. Now, I love this quote. This is from Jeff McJunkin. Any, any of you know Jeff? Couple of you, I expected a woo on that, but whatever. Jeff's another a fantastic uh, instructor, wicked smart. Uh, everything is stealthy until you're watching for it, which kind of goes back to my original payloads. In the olden days, we were looking for a lot of the, the, the malware related to the, remember in the olden days, you go to your parents' house and their browser would have like 15. Yeah, he's doing the hit. You'd have like rows of the extra crap installed, right? Like that's what our AV looked for. And that was it. It was like, well, good enough. And of course, things have, have fast forwarded. Things are, they're, the defensive products are doing a lot better job looking. And it's gotten harder for us, which is good, right? It's very much a cat and mouse style game. Right, my, my, my payload development people know this, like you get a payload working the Thursday before your test on Monday, come Monday, you're burned. And you're like, I didn't even do anything. Like I, I, did, I didn't even do anything. And now I'm busted. And there's a lot of sort of simple techniques. A lot of it's just dumb luck. And when we're creating these payloads, it's not like it's a scientific process where we make a change and we can tell where we're getting caught. It's like, let's change this thing. Did it work? Nope. Let's change some other random crap. And then it works. And we see this sort of evolution over time where we figure out these little tips and tricks to get our payload to properly execute. Now, every little AV, every company has different AV products, different defensive products. They're updated daily in some places. Um, so I'm gonna talk through some of these scenarios. All, all of these um, tips and tricks 
they're all publicly available. So I'm just trying to condense all of these pieces here uh, for you. So I'm not that, I'll get people at home, bad, whatever the word you put after that, that means like, there's like some really smart people out here doing some super advanced research for stuff, but I can't tell you how many times the simple dumb stuff kind of works. In fact, there's a, a great example here in a little bit. In fact, I do a, a talk, my favorite talk, Hacking Dumberly. It's just the stupid tricks that work. And many times it's these dead, simple things. Now, some of these are gonna be more advanced or might be new to you, a little bit more technically technical, but a lot of the simple stuff here sort of works. So I'm gonna try to compile a big list that me and my team are using to get working payloads on our pen tests and our red teams, okay? So we're gonna talk through, what do we have to think about before we start developing our payload? What are the different options we have available to us? Well, how are we gonna bypass these defensive tools? If we're running in a sandbox, what are some of the, the options here? What do the detections look like and other ways we can get some of this uh, execution? So let's talk through some of the initial considerations here. We see a lot of code, a lot of malware development. Traditionally, it was a lot of it in C and C++. Any C++, C++ developers here? A couple, Jean made in the back, like, yep, got it. I am a terrible C++ programmer. I can seg fault with the best of them. I don't understand why are there so many, like what's a pointer to a point? I, I, I don't understand, not my jam, okay? C Sharp, the .NET framework, for me, a little bit more accessible. And we're seeing a lot of development in that because it is more accessible. And it is the heart of Windows. And we don't have to worry about those pesky pointers and, and some of the managed code problems we have to worry about. Any of you do any uh, VBA? VBA was written by Satan, okay? That is the worst language known to mankind. It, 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 it's ugly, the, the editors inside of your macros are, are even worse, it's terrible. But we've got a lot, a lot of opportunity here inside of macros and such. Any uh, Rust folks, Golang, Nim? Really? I, I can't even spell name. Python, any Python folks expect Mark Baggett to be super excited, right? We've got a lot of other options. In fact, Mark uh, Baggett was on, we, we do this thing every Wednesday, 1.30 Central Time, called the Wednesday Offensive. And Mark yesterday was talking about how you can use Python in a pen test, and he was doing some really cool stuff with extracting uh, cookies using ETW. We'll talk about ETW in just a little bit. But sometimes Python is installed in these systems. In fact, Microsoft has some cool tricks to install it quite easily. We're not gonna to spend too much time on that. We're gonna spend a lot more time looking at stuff on the labs, right? Built-in capabilities without having to bring um, our own interpreter or compile, cross-compile, which essentially turns it oftentimes into C or uh, .NET. A lot of different file formats. Executable. Windows is crazy, right? We got a good old executables. That's the thing that we commonly use for our execution, right? Use for our persistence. DLLs, of course, right? My favorite and the single dumbest format known to mankind, HTA. Like someone decided it would be a great idea to take HTML and also be able to run, I don't know, any core function in Windows, right? You're like, oh, here's this HTA. Oh, it's just a web app. It's totally fine. Uh, all sorts of nasty stuff in there. We've got our good old bat files, com files, uh, J, J script, C script with VBA. So there's a ton of different ways, different file formats that we can use for execution on Windows, which is an opportunity for us. Right, it gives us a lot of different ways where we might be able to get our execution. 
Now, when we're doing our payload development, it's important to understand how our payload is used, right? If I create the payload and I run it on my system, oftentimes it's gonna work. What happens now if I put it up on a web server and the user has to download it, right? How many of you are familiar with Mark of the Web as we like to call it? Yeah, right? So if you've ever seen this, if you ever go open this up something in Windows, and you double click on an executable, it'll say this file was downloaded from the internet. Are you sure you want to execute it? So my, uh, Microsoft adds this alternate data stream, this zone identifier, and it says, hey, this came from the internet. And if it came from the internet, your defensive products are gonna take a little bit closer look at it. Like, hey, this wasn't already here. It didn't come from the inside. It came from that evil internet. So we'll take a better look into it. What I would like to do, of course, get my payload to not have that. There's a, a number of different options. One option, and this becomes a chicken and egg problem, I could use something already on the system that isn't the browser to pull down my file. Right? This could be an Excel file. And when I run it or open it, it runs a macro which now copies down the file, builds it itself manually. It didn't come through the browser, so it doesn't get that tag. Now, the, the problem is how do I get that first piece there in a first, first place? Right? We, we hit this sort of infinite loop of well, how do I get execution if I don't have execution so that I can actually get the execution, right? So th this can be a little bit of a, a struggle here. We have some other options. If you put it in some kind of a container, um, certain utilities, if I put an executable inside a zip and I extract that zip file, the mark of the web that's on the zip file doesn't get passed through. This is a little bit more difficult because the built-in zip inside of Windows is going to pass through that mark of the web. So not as effective as it, as it once was. If you've got a tar or a rar archive, it's typically not going to pass through that mark of the web. The problem is how many of you on a Windows system have a tar executable or rar? Right, so that becomes a little bit of an issue. Um, virtual hard disks. This is a cool little trick built into Windows, I think it's seven and later. If I give you a v VMDK file, you can right click and mount it in Windows. I learned this like last week. You can right click and mount it. You're mounting now essentially a VMware drive on your Windows system guess what you don't get in that executable file, that mark of the web. The ISO files, right? Anybody remember back in the, the, the 90s and 2000s, burning the ISO files with our DVD burner? Yeah, yeah, right, we downloaded a lot of movies. I mean, I didn't, my friends did, right? Download, deal with these, she's like, yeah, I got a whole bunch of them. Yeah, now unfortunately, well, for me as an offensive person, Microsoft, what is it, a couple of months ago, two months, three months, changed it. It used to be before that, if I gave you an ISO file, you double click on it, automatically mounts. And if I ran an executable that was inside that, it didn't get passed through that mark of the web. Microsoft has since patched that. But if you've got an older system, maybe this still works. Here's an example. We're going to take a look at the, uh, the alternate data stream here for a file that we downloaded from the internet, test.exe. And if you look here, we see the uh, zone identifier, right? You see the top row here, colon zone identifier, that's the alternate data stream. Um, inside of that is a number that's associated with where you downloaded it from, whether it was from the local intranet or the internet, that is the mark of the web. 
Now, here's an example. If we have this tar file, and in this example, the tar file did come to the internet and has the mark to the web. If we use tar, extract it, look at the executable, no mark of the web. This means that our defensive products aren't going to take the same look at it, right? We're not going to get that pop-up in Windows that says, this came from the internet. It is guaranteed to be bad. So it's one piece in sort of in some bypassing some of these, these tools. By the way, this is freaking awesome. Isn't it the, the live drawing thing? No, no, no. That was a statement. This is awesome. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, thank you to the person drawing because it's so cool. You can put that on the slide if you want. Um, okay, so we talked about some of the initial pieces here. I'm all over the place, folks. Welcome to, welcome to my world. Let's talk a little bit about bypassing some of the, the initial protections and some of the, uh, the defenses here. We've got AMSI. AMSI is the anti-malware scanning interface. This was a massive step forward in security in Windows. Before this, every single AV and EDR had to figure out, well, when Excel runs and there's a macro, how do I look at the macro? And McAfee would do it one way, Semantic would do another, and they all had to figure this out on their own. And Microsoft said, hey, we're gonna give it to you in a silver platter. I, I honestly think it was because they didn't want to get sued by the, e, the EU because Defender could look inside. That's a whole different discussion. But they gave this to us. It was great. It was a huge step forward. So if you run a script, open a macro, PowerShell, it will give the, an opportunity to these defensive products to say, hey, do you want to take a look at this first? Take a look at this and say yes or no before we continue. Really, really neat capability. The thing is, for this to work, it's loaded inside the process. Whose process? My process. Well, remember, the processes can modify themselves. So we've got opportunities to say, oh, AMC, you're in my process? Yeah, cool. Get the hell out of here. And there's some interesting ways to, uh, to do some of this. Um, one of my favorite ways, this is really clever, a manifestation, uh, Matt Graber tweeted this a few years ago. It was a PowerShell one-liner that used .NET. What it did is it told AMPSI, yeah, you didn't actually load. So that when AMPSI tried to run, it'd be like, oh, we didn't load properly. Oh, well, carry on then. Really cool way to say, hey, you just died here and you can't actually run. We could patch the AMC scan buffer and be like, cool, why don't you scan this instead? Um, PowerShell version two does not support AMC. So if you literally go into Windows and type PowerShell dash version two, now you get a clean copy. There's other ways where we can make some of these modifications, but it becomes a chicken and egg problem, right? Like if I'm trying to disable AMC, guess who gets to look first? AMC, right? So if I just run in PowerShell, AMC tools, AMC sees that as like, whoa, don't say my name. Get your name out of your mouth, right? Sorry, that was my terrible Will Smith impression, right? So we have to piece it together. We take Unicode A plus M plus S and add it to this other characters, build the string, turn some of these things off. The AMC.fail here, this is a website you can go to, and they've got a big list of AMC bypasses. You go there, click generate. It will take one of the random payloads, uniquely encode it, and give you a way that might bypass AMC on your system. But remember, this is very dynamic, right? What works last week might not be working uh, today here. We've got the ETW, Event Tracing for Windows. 
what we can have is our defensive products have build a, a, a consumer and look for certain events. If this particular action is taking, taking place in your, your process, you can have your AV product say, whoa, hold on, I wanna look at this now. Something funky just happened. Let me take a look at, at this piece, right? So we're gonna see a lot of these AV EDR products building these event consumers. Now, different products are gonna do it differently. Some products are gonna watch some events, but not others. So when we're building our payloads, it's always important, know your target, right? Know your target. I don't have to bypass every single EDR. How many do I have to bypass? One, yeah, good answer, all right, yeah, one, right? Which one? The one my target is using. So when I'm doing this development, I wanna figure out, usually just as simple as asking, say, hey, what defensive product or products are you using? And then we get a copy of it, we test against that, build our payload so we can get our evasion, right? What are some of the ways around this? Well, it's gonna be, it's gonna do, our tools are gonna do a lot of just simple string checks. If your executable is called Mimicats, you're done, right? Like if you take Solitaire and rename it to Mimicats, it probably won't run, right? If you inside your executable, you have a lot of functions that are called Mimicats something, you're gonna have a problem. I'm more of a dog person, so to go into the executable, replace the stupid cats with some friendly dogs, now we get execution, right? Uh, there's also in .NET, you have the namespace. Well, if I've got the namespace mimic cats, Rubius, easy way to get caught. Simple things like changing that text and now we might get a, a bypass, right? Recompile it, the signature is not gonna match. Um, we're gonna talk about some of the API hooks here in a little bit, but we could patch some of that uh, as well. What our defensive products are gonna do is they're gonna hook various function, function calls. So you wanna call something like, I don't know, virtual protect. You're not gonna call the real thing. Well, you are, but the first few bytes of that are actually gonna call your EDR, right? Well, I don't want that. We got a couple of different options that we can do here. Like let's say I really wanna call here NT read virtual memory. And instead it's been hooked. So we get this jump. This jump is gonna jump to the EDR. It's gonna analyze what we're trying to do and either continue to let us run or abort the execution. The original function is down below. One option is I could simply do is rewrite the bytes. I think I got a dead clicker. You can actually clicker or just advance it. It's like the 80s with your TV remote, right? Somebody have a, is there another clicker? Try it now. There we go, cool. How do I go back? There we go, cool. So one, one thing I can do is I can look at those DLLs and instead of this jump here at the beginning, I can replace it, right? I can go in and start making modifications. Now we have to be careful because if we start making modifications to the DLL, maybe our AV EDR is gonna detect this, right? Another option is we'll just get a clean copy. Just reload the DLL from disk. It's a clean copy and now I'm good to go. Really cool trick here is with freeze. So what we do is from our executable, we launch Notepad, but we launch Notepad in a suspended state. Grab that DLL, because if I start reloading 
like NT DLL and other DLLs from disk, AB is gonna be like, bro, you've already got that. Why are you trying to do that again? No normal executable is gonna try to reload things that should already be there. So we let Notepad load it, copy from that, put it over top, and now we're good to, uh, to go here. But again, this is our chicken and egg problem, right? How do I get those first couple of function calls that don't get caught so that I can overwrite, so that I can run for uh, forever here, right? So we've got our, our sys calls here, right? I wanna call a lot of the API functions inside of Windows. We've got the, the NT, the ZW API calls. These are sort of gatekeepers to the kernel. And they're gonna check permission levels and other weird and interesting things. But if we look inside this function, the function here is uh, NTDL, NT write file. If we look at the guts here, you can see here I'm putting eight, the ordinal eight into EAX. And then I'm calling syscall. That's what this function is ultimately doing, this API is, is ultimately doing. So what I could do with the eight in EAX and call syscall myself. Now there's a few problems. We saw when this first came out that malware authors were hard coding these numbers and then just calling syscall. So we saw with different versions of Windows these syscall numbers can change a little bit. So I need to figure out versions, get my own table. Um, what I can do, these first three, what these do is they're going to enumerate that for me. They're gonna look at the DLLs, get the proper syscall numbers so that I can use that number, EX8, and then call my syscall. And in a different version of Windows, it could be Seven, just making up numbers here. We could do it ourselves, right? Write our own code to do the same sort of thing. These uh, sector seven and sys whispers two and three will do that in automated fashion uh, for us. Let's talk a little bit about sandbox. So what happens when we launch an executable is I, the user, want this thing to run. And I want it to run right freaking now, right? I don't, I, I don't want to click the executable and have to wait 15 minutes for the thing to do something. So what's going to happen is this executable, if it's the, especially if it's the first time it's being run, it'll get run inside of a sandbox inside of our EDR. Now, the EDR doesn't have much time because if it takes too long, Users are going to complain and they're going to buy different products. Did I advance by myself? Whoops, there we go. Good. Right? It's going, to, it's going to look at the sandbox, run this thing. But again, we only have a limited amount of time before we start impacting the performance of the, uh, the system here. Right? So, there's some techniques here to bypass this sandbox so we can get our execution. One option, slow everything down, right? Now, if I use a sleep and say sleep 30 seconds, well, the sandbox can see that. In fact, what we oftentimes see is the sandboxes will sort of modify the sleep function and have the sleep function immediately turn around and say, yeah, sleep is done. So if I say sleep 30 seconds in the sandbox, the sleep is actually zero and it will continue the execution. So instead, what we need to do is really hard things. So we have our executable calculate prime numbers. Right, we have our, 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 our computer, our program here, calculate the Fibonacci sequence, count to 15 trillion, right? Something that's gonna take a lot of time and isn't obviously shortcut it because we only have so much time in the sandbox, right? We only have a fraction of a second 
And if we can stall in the middle, we can do some cool things. I saw another technique, this is actually kind of old, but what it did is, this, and this is really cool, it would call the sleep, it would run NTP, so it would get the time, call sleep, and when the sleep was done, it would do an NTP call again. Well, if I'm supposed to sleep for 30 seconds, and NTP only changed by a fraction of a second, I'm in a sandbox. And of course, take a whole different path and be like, yep, totally, totally cool here. Nothing to see. And we're not going to expose the bad things, right? So a lot of different opportunities here. Another one, and this is my favorite. This is the dead simple way. Just make it a really big file. Because the AVs be like, oh, that's, that's too hard. I don't, I don't have, I don't have time for that. I can't, I can't look at files over 50 meg. And the first time I heard this, I'm like, I mean, I thought about this, but are you serious? It works. And the AB's like, oh, that's too big. That's, that's too hard. That's too much work. I can't do this. There's a, there's dig dug mangle that will do this uh, automated for us. Literally just cat. If you want to make the file larger, add some junk to the end. Be very careful adding completely random chunks to the end. We'll talk about entropy here in just a, a little bit. Other things we can do. That sandbox is not gonna look perfectly like a normal user's computer. If it's got like one processor, well, that's, that's odd. If it has like two gigs of total memory, that's funky. If it's not joined to the domain, that's even odder. If the username isn't what we expect, we can use this. And if we detect things are odd, we take the clean, the safe code path. And the sandbox says, yep, this is totally cool. It lets it run. Right now, this would might take some additional knowledge. Who am I targeting? What's the username? What's the domain that I'm targeting here? so that I can tailor this guardrail to make sure that I, I, I get the execution that I, that I want here, right? Talked about this, RAM, resolution, et cetera. Let's talk through some of these static detections. So when we're loading our code here, what we see oftentimes, or what we traditionally did, is the executable portion contained all of the bad stuff, right? Go back 10, 15 years. Now, every AV product, offensive product, worth its salt, knows, look at the part that's executable. So we had to modify this. We had to put our shell code in a different spot, right? So we put it in, in, in variables. We, we put it in other locations where it might not get the same level of, of, of scrutiny. But that, of course, that means if I've got it someplace else, I need to get it into an executable location in memory, right? And that's a, that's a place where we oftentimes uh, get caught. So we could store it. Here's a number of different options. Um, this was, who was it? Joff Fire, maybe, with Black Hills. I think one of the Black Hills, I think, folks did this but used um, UUIDs as a replacement for the shell code. Um, Mike Saunders on my team came up with a tool called Jargon. And what it does is it uses dictionary words, right? Just, just words in the, the English dictionary and maps, for example, byte 01 here to cat, byte 02 to ball. So one, you don't see my shell code. Two, very low entropy, right? It just looks like text. It just looks like a bunch of text put together. And then what my code or my executable is going to do, take this, whether it's the UUIDs, the dictionary words, convert it to the shell code, and then start some of our execution. We could also load from something that has high entropy. High entropy, high randomness, oftentimes gets us caught. So we can load it from a, a, a GIF, a PNG, something that's supposed to have high entropy, 
copy that into memory and then execute that, right? Static signatures, we've got to be very careful with those default payloads from any of our C2 products, Metasploit, Cobalt Strike, um, Sliver, whatever, we've got to modify that. If you're using Cobalt Strike, there's like 50 different little kits that you can use to modify that the way that the executable runs. It takes a little bit of work, but now things are going to look different. My code is going to look different. Your compiler matters, right? You're, how many of you have internal developers, right? What development platform are they probably using? .NET, right? So what's the, what's the IDE? Visual Studio, right? Almost everybody that's doing development in Windows, Visual Studio. It has patterns that you can use to identify the compiler. If all of a sudden I show up with executables from Ming GW, Ming W, whatever, I can never get the name right. Like, hey, that's, that's odd. That's atypical. Uh, you can get compilers from GitHub. Well, if it came from GitHub, maybe I trust it, or maybe I don't. So if we compile it differently, we can get past some of these things, right? Change the variable names, change the variable lengths, change function names. Uh, change the keys that are inside my executable. Literally start changing uh, everything here. Now, when we have our executable and we want it to run, there's an order of operations that has to happen, right? The first thing I need to do, get some memory, right? So I'm taking my jargon and I need to convert it to shell code. I need a chunk of memory where my shell code is going to run. So I get my chunk of memory. Step one. Step two, copy my payload and probably decrypt it at the same time, convert it to executable, and then execute that. Now, if I do this all one after another after another, we got a problem, right? Like if I see my kid come into the kitchen, get matches, go all of a sudden to the garage, grab some, uh, some gasoline, and then walk into the backyard with some firecrackers, stuff's about to get real in the backyard. I mean, I would let it go, but my wife definitely would not, right? But if we get the matches, wait a half an hour, I forgot what was going on, right? Then we get the gasoline, wait a half an hour. I already forgot, right? So what we can do is break this up, calculate the large numbers, prime numbers, uh, Fibonacci sequence, whatever, to slow this down so it's not bad, 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 bad right in a row. It's bad, good, bad, good, and then we can get our, uh, our, our execution. So don't be sketchy immediately. Be sketchy later. Give it some time. Let the AV get tired of you. Let it get bored and say, I got better things to do because it can't monitor forever. If it did, it would drastically slow down our system here. Right. And if I like if I'm launching my Adobe PDF reader and it's all of a sudden calling CMD, that's not normal. Right. Don't do sketchy things. And if we do wait a little bit. Let's talk about some of the execution methods, executables, sketchiest sketch of a sketchy thing that could ever be sketched. Right? So we have to be a little bit careful with those. Very heavily monitored, heavily scrutinized. If we've got some sort of application uh, control technology, we might not get execution in the first place. We've got other options with bouncing off CMD. CMD is quite heavily monitored. One of the cool tricks here is this explore with a separate flag. So for example, we love to proxy through Teams. Teams is installed in the user, uh, the, the uh, user install location, whatever you, whatever you call that, not C program files, which means I can modify that, right? Launch Teams, get my Teams, and we'll talk about some of the DLL stuff in just a second here. Teams will call CMD because Teams will load things like Word and Excel. So it's not bad necessarily if CMD comes from Teams, it's if Teams calls CMD, calls who am I, now we got a problem. So if we have Teams 
call CMD, which calls Explorer, which calls our thing, we've broken up the chain. We can actually run Explorer with a separate flag. So it creates a new Explorer. Underneath that Explorer, we get a separate executable. Our Explorer, after a minute or two, dies. And now we have this executable running without a parent process. And we've seen literally in the last week, actively in engagement right now, my team is working on, where their EDR lost complete visibility. They saw it for a, about a minute and a half and then not a thing. Really simple, cool little trick there. And that technique has been out since 2014. Neat, what's old is new again. MS installer files, if we have things like the always install with privileges or whatever the registry setting is called. If I double click an MSI file, it will run as, as, as the high privileges, not common, but it does work sometimes. We can do things in uh, link file service binaries here uh, as well. Other things we love to do, use built-in executables, use those signed by Microsoft already on the system and trampoline off of those into our own executable. Right, so we've got like the MS build technique here. Um, with MS build, if you create an XML, XML file called csproj, if you double click MS build.exe or run it, if csproj is in the same directory, it will automatically be executed. And there's no additional command line arguments. So it's a little bit uh, stealthier here. And we can create inline tasks. We can run it from remote SMB shares. We can run it from the internet, all sorts of other fun and interesting things with, uh, with that. Um, install util in Windows by default, right? Already there, already gonna be allowed, built-in executable. We can, we can uh, bounce off of that uh, as well here. Install util, we do have to give it a DLL in this case. Um, might take a little bit of social engineering in this case, send over the zip file, tar file, whatever, uh, with a DLL inside to, to execute uh, this. We have the proxy DLL. This is a weird feature. In fact, this is one of the things that we use with Teams. So what you can do is because Teams is installed in the, the user's directory, I can modify that. So what I can do is sort of a DLL hijacking by design, not sort of, like actual DLL hijacking by de design. So I could say, oh, here I have my own version.dll. And I'm gonna get the version of Windows that I'm running on. It runs my DLL, which will get the version number, but it's also gonna run the code of my choosing in there. So we get our proxy DLL uh, in this particular um, scenario. Example here, the user app data folder, that's the name, blanking on the app data. Uh, again, writable by every single uh, user in their home directory, okay? So we're gonna wrap that up. There's some free resources that are available here. Um, check out the slides. I think the slides are gonna be available, right, Steve? Cool, so you get the slides, lots of other stuff, uh, tools here as well. But this is a very advanced, not terribly advanced, but it does take a lot of time, a lot of frustration, a tremendous amount of bourbon to, uh, to, to get some of this stuff working, but it's a lot of trial and error. There's a ton of resources that are out there. We don't see all those resources in the same spot because if we have like a hack by numbers for everything, guess where the AV direct uh, and EDR products are gonna go and look. Right, like, oh, cool. This is the exact technique everybody's using. So you do have to spend a little bit of time uh, sort of piecing some of these things to it together here. All right, any questions? Oops, back one. Awesome talk, Tim, thanks for bringing the energy at the end of the day. No, stay up here, you gotta come. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I went over time and there's drinks and stuff. Yeah, and and this you, guy, you people at home already have drinks. Yeah. He just flew in back from Jakarta, Indonesia. So he's like, I don't know where the energy is coming from. I think he's just probably waking up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. But um, definitely some questions. You can tackle the rest of them online, sure. but just to ask a couple here while we have you. Um, if Defender is disabled on a system because I'm running another endpoint protection, will AMSI still be called AMSI DLO? Yeah, so the other AV products will hook AMSI instead. 
Uh, there was one that was late to the game. I think sem Semantic was a little bit late to the game, but every every single one of the major AV products, EDR, defensive, whatever you want to call it, they're all going to hook into AMC. They they should. Yes. Nice. Can you still find what you need through Windows event logs by the event ID if AMC.dll is disabled? Then rewrite to pull the data from there instead of Defender. Yeah, so that's two separate pieces. So if I have like a an event for if you got the auditing enabled, it doesn't disable that feature. The AMC, all that does is lets the defensive products take a look and go, no go the execution. It doesn't impact the, the logging associated with that. Cool, we'll do one more question. The rest you can take online. Um, I've recently heard that PowerShell 7, if downloaded from the GitHub and run as its own executable rather than installed, will be completely ignored by EDR no matter what you're doing with it. Wondering if you've heard of that in any insight. Nope, but I'm going to text <laughs> my team right after this. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that was an easy answer. All right, cool. Cool. All right, well, thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. Thank you.